what if I told you there was a way you could take control of your data and privacy online and it wouldn't involve selling your soul to the devil? Spoiler, I'm about to push this concept on you harder than a car salesman with bills to pay and deliver the video with the same energy as an excitable sled dog because it's that good and nobody's talking about it. Part one, what's the problem? In 2017, the internet turned 28 years old and much like many 28 year olds, they feel like they've lost their way and are a disappointment to their parents. The internet's dad, Tim Berners-Lee, wrote a letter about the three challenges the internet faces. The first one being, we've lost control of our data. The TLDR here is that currently, websites offer us a free service in exchange for our data, but we have no choice. If we want to use Facebook, Twitter, WhatsApp, or Spotify, we have to agree to their terms of service and give up our data. This means that our data is scattered all over the internet, and some companies, somehow legally, sell our data to third parties without us ever even knowing. To solve this problem, Tim, or Timmy as nobody ever calls him, is working on a solid solution. Solid is a bit of code that allows you to take control of your data. Tim Berners-Lee has set up a not-for-profit to work out how to turn this idea into a service. It's a bold strategy, Cotton. Let's see if it pays off for him. But what we know at the moment is Solid is not a new internet. It's an extension of the current one, and you don't need anything special to use it, just your web browser of choice. The basic idea of Solid is to take control of all your data and centralize it in a place that you control. In Solid, this place is called a pod. Pods can store any information about you, from your country, to your age, to your street name, to your favorite TV shows, the bands you love, or even your porn preferences. Pods give you control over what you share, who you share it with, and you can revoke access at any time. Once more for the people at the back. You take personal responsibility for all your data, who sees it and for how long. Today, social networks like Facebook store all your data on their servers, but a social network built on Solid would have to ask you for access to your pod, and if you grant them permission, all your posts and other information would be pulled out in the same way an RSS feed works today. Can you see why this solution is about as popular at Facebook HQ as a baby named Adolf is in Germany? Part two, data access. An interesting side effect of all of this is you can give multiple sites access to the same data. For example, I use Netflix to watch TV, and over time I built up a big database of my favorite shows and actors that I enjoy. But because all my preferences are locked away in their database, if I want to move to Disney+, Plus, Paramount TV, or YouTube Premium, I'd have to start all over and wait for them to get used to what my preferences are. It's a bit like when you're dating and you have to ask every new match what their favorite color is over and over again. It not only gets boring, but it puts you off finding a new service altogether, creating a monopoly when we're talking about streaming services and a sad, lonely YouTuber when we're talking about dating. At the risk of mixing metaphors, you're never alone when you're drinking with the TV on. Anyway, Tim calls this process data silos because the data is siloed off from its competitors and it's the main reason why when we sign up to a streaming platform, it's actually easier to stay on it even if there's nothing new for us to watch. And because we all only have a certain amount of money to throw around, if some of our disposable income is tied up with Netflix, to put it mildly, that's a competitive advantage over new streaming services to say the least. But if I owned my TV streaming data, I could give both Disney Plus and Netflix the same access. And when I watch something on Netflix, it would update my interests in that pod not just on Netflix server. So Disney Plus would benefit from that as well and hopefully offer me something interesting to watch based on this new information. This gives startups a fair and equal chance to develop and grow their user base. The data in the pod is known as vocabularies. Think of these like standard file formats like JPEG, MP3 or PDF files. These files can be opened by many different programs. How is nobody talking about this? Part three, the truth. Now I don't want to sound all Donald Trump on you here, but the truth online is a big problem. However, your pod becomes the single source of truth about you. This means if you move house, you can change your address in your pod and every site you've given access to will see it. Not only does this save you time, money, and energy alerting multiple websites that some information has changed, but it means the data is worth more to that website, as they know you have a vested interest in keeping it up to date for yourself more than their advertisers. For once, instead of us giving up all our information in exchange for access, we control the access of what information they get, and they need to give a good service in order to keep it. You hear me, Zuckerberg? We're now as valuable as your advertisers, and if you don't provide us a half-decent service, we're all gonna leave, and your stock price will drop in line with everyone's interest in the Zeppelin industry in the late 1930s. Part four, the boring legal bit. Storing data has become a liability for companies thanks to GDPR, CCPA, and the YMCA. You know that cop means business. But because apps would be accessing your data through our pods, they'd automatically comply with a chunk of legal requirements. 
because we have full control over our data and can revoke the access at any time. Much like living with your ex in an overpriced London flat when you have a deadline to write a sitcom, it's a massive win-win situation. Part five, how do I get a pod? Again, the choice is up to you. You could go with a provider and easily check their data privacy policy or create one yourself because the software is open source and free. Speaking of free, it costs nothing for you to like this video and subscribe to the channel. And if you really wanna support me, you can join my shiny new subreddit, Discord and Patreon. All of those are linked below. It's a great way for me to tell you directly when I bring out a new video. Cheap plugs over, and now we're back to your regularly scheduled program. So now we have a way to store our data and control who gets it. Next, we need a way to identify ourselves on the web. Web ID is the answer. Think of it like login with Google or Facebook, but this time you're not tying yourself to their platform and giving them access to any future activity you do off their website. If you want to use an app, you log in with your web ID. Web ID would not share any of your data with third parties. So at the risk of sounding like Nigel Farage in the run up to the Brexit vote, you take back control. Governments are looking at web IDs to give people access to public services. And it's an amazing idea, although it is incorrectly getting mixed in with vaccine passports and ID cards. And if you'd like to learn more about vaccine passports or ID cards, I've linked to a very interesting, albeit factually inaccurate video from Alex Jones in the comments. Belgium has actually started doing this already. In what I can only describe as a baller move, they've formed a data utility company, giving citizens control over their data. Once more for the people at the back. <clears throat> Sorry, I've, I've had a bad cold. Flemish. No, that's Holland. Anyway, another advantage of this system is that the governments don't need to keep your data up to date, as it's down to the individual citizen to keep their pod information correct. This means you can have a web ID for government services, another for your personal stuff, and another one for your creative online ID. The same as pods. Part seven, what are the issues with solid? Money. Today's apps give us access to a service in exchange for our data. In a solid world, apps would ask us for access to our pods in order to get our data, and they would have to be specific about what they were gonna use it for in terms of advertising or manipulating our emotions. Which, if you know anything about me, I don't actually mind websites having access to my data. I just don't like them not telling me what they're gonna do with it. As a result, this is one small step for man, one giant leap towards my utopia. What happens if you wanna use a website, but you don't wanna give them access to your data? Great question, me and a hat. If you said no, apps could give you an option to pay for their service and give them no data. Pod providers could do the same thing. They can charge you for storage or ask for some of your data in exchange for that storage. Or they could charge some apps for using your data on your behalf. Professor of decentralized tech, Ruben Verbo, said future companies will derive their value from the intelligence they provide. They say you should never judge a book by its cover, but you should judge a Facebook by its privacy policy. Imagine a world where companies make money by providing the best service possible, and we don't just use them because it's easier because they're holding our data hostage. Some say I'm a dreamer, but I'm not the only one. But what if an app copies my data to their servers? Technically, they could do that, but legally, it would put them in a position where you could sue them if they refuse to delete it when you revoke access. Currently, our lack of privacy is down to a consequence of an unsustainable business model. And as a result, something has to change. But what do you think? Do you like Tim's new model for the internet? Would you like to take accountability for your data and privacy? Or do you like the current method where ignorance is bliss? Please write all your thoughts in the comments below because this isn't just a video, I'd like it to be a conversation.